Welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine and welcome to the coolest location we've found ourselves in yet. This is Alphonse Island on the outer atolls of the Seychelles. It is a remote and beautiful part of the world. It's a destination primarily for fly fishermen who fly in from all over the planet to catch bonefish, triggers, GTs, the elusive permit, and come and enjoy the beautiful surrounds of the Seychelles. It's also a great resort to kick back and relax at. It's beautiful, it's relaxed, it's far away from anywhere. And so it's somewhere that I came with great excitement, but I wasn't too sure about what sort of wine I'd be encountering. I needn't have worried. There's a very pleasant wine list here at the resort. And while Keith Rosinas, the visionary fisherman who's put this place together, is by his own admission not a wine expert, he does have a rather nice wine list that he and his team have assembled. And it's a wine list that I've drawn from. I've picked out four South African wines that are appropriate for different times of your stay here at Alphonse. And the first of those is a very familiar one, Pongratz, very established South African bubbles. Now, it's hard to think of things that Hungarians are famous for. Goulash, perhaps, or one or two footballers, Ferenc Puskas, many, many years ago. This might be the greatest thing Hungary has ever done, sending Mr. Pongratz out of Hungary and over to South Africa, where he had a huge impact on winemaking in the Cape and has given us this memory of his impact on South Africa, the Pongratz Method Cat Classique. Now, there are several reasons you might be opening some bubbles here on Alphonse. Just getting here is cause for celebration. It is such a sublimely beautiful place. Or it might be because you've caught something special, landed that big GT, caught that permit. Or in my case, as a non-fisherman, gone out on day one and landed a rather large sailfish after a fairly brutal fight. It was great fun, caught, got my photo, released, as is the case here at Alphonse. And so now I need to toast what is my first proper fish ever caught. And this is a good South African way to do exactly that. Years ago, when I was still on radio on Cape Talk, I remember a discussion of a blind tasting where Pongratz had come out on top, beating a number of French houses, amongst others. And it is a cup classique that maybe doesn't always get quite as much recognition as it deserves. It's a nice, cr simple, crisp feel to it. Uh, and when you've just caught a very large fish, as I have, you want something that's celebratory, uh, that's not too rough on the palate, and that's just going to give you that uh, that zest of celebration and that's exactly what this does uh, it is in celebration of my rather large fish and it's a nice South African way to raise a glass to the start of a glorious fishing career now catching fish on Alphonse is great fun provided you can do it what's just as much fun and a lot easier is eating fish on Alphonse Island over the course of this week we've had some superb snapper we've had some rosy job fish which I had for the first time we had a fair amount of wahoo and all of that fish is washed down excellently with a glass of white wine. And there's a selection you can choose from here. But what I've opted for is something that caught my eye on the wine list very quickly indeed. From my friends in the Hemelanada Valley, the Sauvignon Blanc from Beauchard Finlayson. You remember last month, as part of my epic wine route, I dropped in at Beauchard Finlayson. And we showcased on that particular show the Hannibal. It was a close call as to what to choose though, because Beauchard Finlayson do consistently make such a lovely range of wine. And I'd had lunch with David Finlayson, the winemaker. He treated me to some glorious Pinot Noir from his vintage selection, a beautiful vertical tasting. We'd had the Hannibal, but we'd also had the Sauvignon Blanc. In fact, it was what we'd opened up the afternoon with. And it's a Sauvignon Blanc that often sits under the shadow of the Pinot Noir and to a lesser extent, the Chardonnay and the Panibal. It is a Sauvignon Blanc that, not unlike the Pongratz, deserves a little more attention than it sometimes gets. It's a slightly older one. It's uh, five years old now, which, as you'll well know from this show, makes me a happier person, a slightly older one. And it's a reserve. Now, much like wrapping wine up in paper, putting the word reserve on or a couple of nice big stickers is often a good way of suggesting the wine is good. In this case, it's a very well-deserved moniker. Reserve in the sporting world might suggest second best. In the wine world, it means it's that extra special wine that you have set aside. And in this case, an extra special Sauvignon Blanc from a part of the world that makes the varietal quite beautifully. 
Now the color of this, as you can see, is very light, but that belies the depth to this wine. There's a good solid mouthful of Sauvignon Blanc there. A little bit to the age, a little bit to the style, that slightly greener feel to it. And when you're eating it with a fresh piece of fish, that in all likelihood was in that ocean behind me an hour or two before it actually landed on your plate, then you want some wine that's gonna do such a fresh catch justice. And this is just what you need. So you've had your bubbles, you've had your Sauvignon Blanc, onto a varietal that just screams out, I'm in a paradise island in summer, Rosé. Now it wasn't all that long ago that the only people you'd find in South Africa drinking rosé were either 12 or cut hair for a living. But rosé's undergone an extraordinary regeneration over the last little while. The image has changed entirely and so too is the wine where rosé would often be slightly thick, slightly sweet, slightly vomit inducing in many cases. It's now a lot more refined, it's a lot softer, it's a lot subtler without losing that core strength. And it's become a wine that throughout summer is far more respectable, far more appreciated and is moving in great volumes. And here at Alphonse Island, Rosé is selling in vast numbers. The Whispering Angel from Provence is a wine that does really well here. This is a, maybe the poor man's version, slightly more entry level, but still I think a lovely example of that Provencal style Rosé. It's out of Stiernberg, famously described by the cricket writer Neil Manthorpe a number of years ago as a high density township for white millionaires. It's a little more than that. It's got an exceptional golf course and it makes some very, very nice wine indeed. JD down at Sternberg has a magical touch. He's the guy who's also working with the Kleiner Vena Corp. And between them and Sternberg, you see a great array of what he's able to produce. Now, I think the rosé that Sternberg has put together is a really, really strong credit to the array of wines to come out of the estate. And it's a great wine as you sit on the beach at Alphonse Island, forgetting about the rest of the world and enjoying another day in an extraordinarily lovely place. Now the first thing that gets you here is the colour. I think salmon is the word that's used. That was really invented by men who wore shirts of that colour but didn't want to admit to wearing pink. So salmon it is and it's a beautiful slight light pastel pink. It's just delightful. The sun, we're mid-afternoon here in the Seychelles, is catching it perfectly and it's just screaming out to be tasted. So this is 100% Shiraz, and you can pick up on the nose that it's certainly very different to the kind of nose you might get in a white wine, but there's still that lightness, a very understated wine that's still got enough substance to take you through a, an afternoon of sitting by the beach. Uh, there's not too much danger in Alphonse. There are no dangerous reptiles, no poisonous spiders. Really, there are only two ways you can get into trouble on this island. One is if a coconut lands on your head, and the other is if by your seventh bottle of rosé, you still haven't learned how to say no. And I can understand how that might happen. And then to our final wine for this week. Now, in an island where the temperature is frequently over 30 degrees and humidity makes Durban feel a little dry, you're not going to be drinking that much red wine. Certainly not a big Shiraz, a big Bordeaux blend. It's just too hot, too warm for it. It's not going to sit comfortably most of the time. You can take the, uh, the heat off it, pop it in the fridge if you want, uh, but I prefer to do that with a wine that I think naturally sits better a little cooler. And what better wine to answer that particular call than a Pinot Noir. Now this is from Glen Carlo, a stretch of the world I know well. I got married at the estate next door, Baxburg, uh, and Glen Carlo is an estate I've often dropped by to visit. They make a, a Chardonnay that I find particularly pleasant. Uh, they've got a lovely art gallery out there. It's just a nice spot to drop in and say hello to, and even more so when you have some of the Pinot Noir to taste. Now, the Parle area, not perhaps normally associated with Pinot Noir, but this is a wine uh, that they've put a lot of faith in and a wine that's found its way all the way to the Seychelles. And if it's made that effort, who am I not to do the honor of drinking it? Now, if you have a look at the color of this, it's basically a sunburnt version of the previous wine. Slightly darker, slightly more intense, but still light by red wine standards, as is to be expected for Pinot Noir. Now, it takes very little to get me to drink Pinot Noir. It's my favorite grape but I've drunk it particularly this week for one specific reason. And that's because I have eaten my body weight, if not more, in fresh tuna. There has been tuna hauled out of that sea behind me 
pretty much on the hour. And every single meal we've had, including breakfast, has had the option of fresh seared tuna. And we get some fairly nice tuna in South Africa, but if, like me, you live in Johannesburg, all too often it's tuna that's been frozen and then arrives in your supermarket or at your fishmonger. This, not frozen, it hasn't even cooled down. It's out of the water, cleaned, and into the kitchen. And as a result, we've gorged on tuna. And while most people would normally associate white wine with fish, when it comes to that meaty red goodness of tuna, a light red wine is ideal. And a Pinot Noir does the job spectacularly. Now, perhaps it's the origin of the wine it, that it's just a little different. Some of the Pinot Noir we've had of late on the show, the Elgin or the Hemelanada Pinot Noir, this has got a bit of a smokiness to it, a little bit of wood to it, almost a, a slightly burnt texture on the palate. But as I've discovered this week, it's accompanied the tuna really well. And just as I've had some great fights with fish out on the water, so it's great to see the fish on the plate and the wine doing battle for superiority uh, and in the end finishing 15 rounds all square and having done a great job. Uh, There's just something about that Pinot Noir that brings a little extra out of the tuna and celebrates that rich, fresh meatiness that a good tuna steak will give you. And so that's the perfect way to wrap up what has been an extraordinary week with Keith Rosinas and his team at Alphonse. Whether you are a fly fisher person or you're just somebody looking to get away from the world and put your feet up for a week, I cannot recommend Alphonse Island highly enough. And there's a wine list that you'd do well to check out also. So if you're looking for some bubbles for a fish you've just caught, if you'd like a Sauvignon Blanc that'll play off your dinner beautifully, the smooth, creamy finish of a rosé or a Pinot Noir to zip that tuna, a great final resting place. There's a wine list to go with everything else that's just perfect on Alphonse Island. Cheers.